Thank you, Rob. Thank so, you, thanks, uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give a talk. And thanks, everyone, for coming. So, today I'm going to talk about finally generating normal subgroup for right angle arting group. And everything I'm going to say here is joint work, work with Monza. So, first of all, maybe I should apologize because maybe I'm in a wrong conference because. Even though this is about cube complexes, the only cube complex that will appear is like in the last 15 minutes, and it's actually a faster retreat. So I'm sorry. It's more algebraic than, than geometric, but I hope you enjoy it. So I'm going to start with the definition of our right angle arching group, just to make sure that everyone uh, is comfortable with the notation, because people usually use um, gammas, but I have problems distinguishing gammas and delta, so I use x. So, uh, so I start with H, which is a, a finite simplicial graph. So the a finite simplicial graph. So here I don't have uh, multiple H's joining the same vertices, and I don't have loops, and I associate a, a group to to my finite simplicial graph. So the corresponding, and I denote it by G X, is given by a presentation. So the generators are the vertices of my graph. So this is a vertex set. And the relations tell me that two generators commute if they are adjacent in, in my graph. Okay, so some easy examples. So for example, if I start with this totally disconnected graph, in the right angle arching group, I have three generators. So the three vertices. And I don't have relations. So I have a pre group of rank three. And in general, you can see that if I start with a totally disconnected graph with n vertices, I will get the, the free group of rank n. So the class of racks extends the class of finally generated free groups. But on the contrary, if I start with a complete graph, so for example, this one, then in the corresponding right angle arching group again, I will have three generators. But the relations tell me that all the generators commute. And so I have a free abelian group of rank three. And again, if I start with a complete graph with n vertices, I will get the free abelian group of rank m. So the class of racks interpolates between the class of uh, finally generated free groups and free abelian groups of, of finite rank. And another nice example is the C4 which is the cycle of length four. So here, if I denote the vertices like that, in the corresponding rock, as you can see, the A and B generate a, a free group because I don't have relations. So this is a free group of rank two. And then the X and the Y again, sorry, the X and the Y also generate a free group of rank two. And since I'm taking the join of the of the graph, I have a direct product. So as you can see, if I have finally many racks and I take the direct product of those racks, I again have a right angle arching group by taking the join of the of the graph. And if I have finally many uh, right angle arching groups and I consider the, the free products, it's again a right angle arching group by taking the disjoint union of the of the graphs. So now that we have more or less like remembered and, and established that in my case, racks are GX and not like a gamma, uh, I will give like a motivation of why we care about uh, finally generated uh, subgroups of right angle arching groups and more generally why uh, we focus on normal subgroups. So let's talk a bit about the motivation. So if I try to understand uh, finally generated normal subgroups of racks, I can start thinking about the easiest class uh, subclass of racks that I have, that is the, the subclass of uh, free groups. So how are finally generated normal subgroups of free groups? They are uh, of finite index, right? So one of the motivations that we have is the knowledge about uh, finally generated normal subgroups of free groups. So, and this, we know it uh, from a long time ago, so almost uh, 100 years. Let's see if I write the, the surname appropriately. Of course not, so this is higher. And, and he proved in, in 1928 that if I have a non-trivial finally generated 
normal subgroup on a free group. So this is a free group. Then I have that compulsively, it needs to have finite index. So this theorem in particular is telling me that free groups uh, do not fiber. The finally generated normal subgroups are very rigid. They need to be a finite index. And actually this theorem that I know it, and that we know it from like a long time ago can be generalized to, to wider uh, or bigger uh, classes of groups. So what I wanna say is that this theorem also holds in, in other settings. So for example, it holds if, if F is a free product, not just a free group, but in general a free product. And this was proved by, by Baumgart, which in the CCC. And more generally, it also holds if I have a finally presented subgroup where the deficiency is greater than one. So maybe I'm gonna write that here. So if F is finally presented with deficiency greater than one. So I'm gonna recall what uh, the deficiency is. So if I have a, a finite presentation, so if I have a finite presentation, so here the, the set uh, X and R, so the set of generators and of the relations is finite, then the deficiency of, of P is just the difference between the number of generators and the number of relations. So if I have a finally presented group, I can take the supremum of all the deficiencies of the finite presentation. So if G is finally presented, then the deficiency of G is just, as I have said, taking the supremum of all the deficiencies of the finite presentations that I have for my finally presented group. So as you can see, if I have a free group, which is, uh, so if I have a free group, uh, the deficiency of the free group is greater than one. So this, uh, like this property generalizes the property that, that we have uh, for, for free groups. So this is a wider class uh, than the finally generated uh, class of free groups. And I, as far as I know, the, the biggest class that we know so that this property holds, so that all the finally generated normal subgroups are a finite index, are the ones where the L2 Betty number is uh, greater or equal than one. So mm, it also holds if F is finally presented with L2 Betty number greater or equal than one. So this I haven't said it, but it was shown by uh, Bieri. And Neumann, when they introduced uh, sigma invariants, so they use those sigma invariants to show that uh, if my finally represented group has deficiency greater than one, then all the finally generated normal subgroups are of finite index. And this uh, was shown, um, I'm sorry, this was shown in 2002. So I won't talk about uh, the L2 Betty numbers, but it holds like if the efficiency of a finally presented group is greater than one, then the first L2 Betty number is greater or equal than one. So this class of uh, finally presented groups is bigger than this class of finally presented. Okay, so I have given you one motivation. So remember that uh, we won't understand why we care about uh, subgroups or right angle arting groups. The first one is that for uh, free groups, uh, they are very rigid, so they are a finite index. And we have seen also that my, my class of right angle arting groups extends the class of racks. So one may wonder if we have kind of the same structure for right angle arting groups. So one that's one of the motivations that we have. And the other one is uh, maybe algorithmic problems because uh, subgroups of right angle arting groups are a very powerful uh, source of uh, counterexamples for, for algorithmic problems. So the second motivation, as I have said, are the algorithmic problems. So again, we want to try to understand if subgroups of right angle arting groups uh, have a good behavior from the algorithmic point of view. So if the conjugacy problem or the membership problem are decidable for, for these subgroups. So first of all, as always, we can try to restrict ourselves to, to easier subclasses. 
So if I, we start with the subclass of, uh, of free groups, we know that all the finally generated subgroups of free groups are again finally generated and free. So the algorithmic problems are decidable in that class. So finally generated subgroups of free groups are finally generated free. And so from here we have that the algorithmic problems are uh, decidable in this in this class of uh, subgroups of free groups. So again, are decidable for finally generated subgroups of free groups. But another natural way of constructing uh, groups is taking direct products, and we have seen that the class of racks is close undertaking uh, direct products. So I can also consider uh, direct products of free groups, and in that case we will see that we are only lost. So here, finally generated subgroups are very rigid. They are again free. But if we consider the regular product of two free groups, finally we don't have a control in the finally generated subgroups. So if we already take the regular product of, of two free groups, for example, of, of rank two, and this, you know that it's still a rank, we know uh, from, yeah, so Mihailova showed a long time ago again. So in the 58, she showed that there is a finally generated subgroup of this direct product where the membership problem is undecidable. So there is a finally generated subgroup of this direct product with undecidable membership problem. And Miller used Mihailova's construction to show that there is also a finally generated subgroup with undecidable conjugacy programs. So later on, so Miller showed that there is a finally generated subgroup of this direct product with undecidable conjugacy programs. So again, for some subclasses of right angle arting groups, so for free groups, we have uh, that uh, finally generated subgroups are good from the algorithmic point of view, but in other right angle arting groups, so for example, in F2 times F2, we are lost in the finally generated subgroups. But Grunewald showed that these two H1 and H2, which are uh, like constructed in a very particular way, are not finally presented. So maybe we can have a hope that if we are more restrictive in the finalness condition, so instead of working with finally generated groups, we work with finally presented groups or groups of target A, then we, we do have that uh, um, our subgroups will have uh, decidable algorithmic problems. So what I have said is that Grunewald using the construction, the way that H1 and H2 are constructed showed that these two subgroups are not finally presented. So even though for, for one free group, finite, present, finite generation was enough, we have seen that for the direct product, finite generation is not enough, but maybe finite presentation is enough and we can say something about finally presented subgroups of direct product of free groups. And that's indeed like the case. So a very nice result of Baumzak and Roosevelt gives us a, a structure theorem for, for finally presented subgroups. So if I have S a finally presented subgroup of the direct product of, of two free groups, so these two are free groups, then we have a control in the structure of S. So then I have that S is either free or S is virtually a direct product of two free groups. So S is virtually a direct product of two free groups. And as a particular corollary of this theorem, we get that when we're restricted to finally presented subgroups, we will have that the algorithmic problems are decidable. So the corollary thanks to this theorem is that the algorithmic problems are decidable for finally presented subgroups of the direct product of two free groups. So even though by this historical result, we know that final generation is not enough, so we don't have a structure for finally generated subgroups, 
Then, thanks to this theorem, we know that if we restrict to finally present the subgroup, so if we are more picky in the finalness condition, we will have that we are safe from this, uh, from this point of view, so that the algorithmic problems are decidable. And remember that our goal is to try to understand some groups of right angle arting groups. So maybe one may wonder that this uh, restriction on the finiteness condition is enough to, to ensure that we are safe from this point of view. So maybe one may wonder that all the finally presented subgroups of right angle arting groups will have decidable algorithmic problem. So the question here is is finite presentation enough to ensure uh, the decidability of the algorithmic problem? So do finally present the subgroup of all rocks have decidable algorithmic problems. So we know that final presentation is enough for F times F prime, so for the direct product of two free groups, but is that enough for all the right angle arting groups? And the answer is, of course, no, uh, and it was uh, replied by, by Brightson. So Brighton saw that there is a, a right angle arting group A and a finite, finally presented subgroup of the direct product. So remember that if I take direct products, I'm still in the class of rags. So this is still a right angle arting group. So there is a right angle arting group and a finally presented subgroup where the uh, conjugacy and the membership problems are undecidable. So as we can see, being picky in the in the finiteness properties of the subgroup is not enough to ensure the algorithmic problems, even though it's enough for direct product of free groups. So the, the next natural question is, okay, if finite presentation is not enough, do I have a property, uh, a sufficient property for the subgroups to ensure that uh, I have a good behavior from the algorithmic point of view? So what we are trying to do is chasing, so, we want a sufficient condition for the subgroups of rags to have decidable uh, algorithmic problems. And if you read the talk, I'm talking about normal subgroups of right angle arting groups. So we will see that asking for normality will ensure that the algorithmic problems are decidable. So this was just like the motivation of why uh, we care about uh, normal subgroups of right angle arting groups. So remember that the first one was uh, the knowledge that we have about uh, finally generating normal subgroups of free groups. And the second one is this uh, weird behavior of uh, finally presented subgroups of right angle arting groups with respect to the algorithmic problems. So now that uh, maybe people care more about these uh, finally generated uh, subgroups of racks. I will give like the, the main result that we have, and then I will explain a bit uh, the consequences of, of that result. If, if the subgroup is F3, uh, I think that, no, I think that you should be safe. Like, even though you ask for F3, you will always have a right angle arting group with undecidable algorithmic problems. Okay, so uh, now the, let's talk about the main result. And in order to, to try to make the, the statement as neat as possible, I will give like two, two small definitions. So uh, if I have a right angle arting group GX, then maybe I can decompose GX as a, as a direct product, where each of the factors is uh, directly in the composable. So this decomposition is uh, like as big as uh, I can. So where GI is a rack and directly in the composable. This is very stupid, but just to make sure that people understand it. So if I have, for example, the P4, which is my favorite right angle arctic group, so it's the one corresponding to this path, then I will have that this is already directly in, in, in the composable, so N equals one here. So I cannot decompose it more. Okay. But if I have, for example, that X is the following, so here I have an F2, and here I have a Z times F2, and I take the joint, 
I will have that in the corresponding right angle arcing group. I have an F2 times Z times F2. So here N equals three. So because this second right angle arcing group can be decomposed more, but this is only something stupid. So this is the, the first thing that I, I wanna have in mind. So a right angle arcing group maybe can be decomposed as a, as a direct product. And the second thing that I wanna talk about is uh, a subgroup being full. So if I have groups H1, H can uh, are groups and I have a subgroup of a direct product, yes. we say that this, uh, this subgroup is, is full if it uh, if the intersection with each of the factors is non trivial so if i have that s intersects in its uh, group is non trivial and here i just want to say that asking a, a group uh, to be full is not such a big deal because if it's not full i can embed it in in a smaller direct product so what i'm trying to say is that hold on sorry so know that if S uh, is not full, so for example, assume that the intersection with the first factor is trivial, then I have that S will be isomorphic to the image uh, forgetting about the, the factor. If I take the projection uh, from this group to H2 times HK, so I, I, I forget about the H1, and S will be isomorphic to the image. So basically I'm saying that I can embed S in a, in a smaller direct product. So that's why I'm saying that asking for fullness is not such a big deal. So it's not like a very big restriction. So now that I have like talked about this and this, we can uh, try to understand the, the main theorem. So remember that what I wanna give is like a structure theorem for finally generating normal subgroups of rack. So I start with a rack and I assume that I can decompose it like that. And I have my non-trivial finally generated normal subgroup. So I have a non-trivial finally generated normal subgroup. And in case I can decompose GX as a, as a direct product, I ask N to be full. But remember again that if it's not full, I can I can assume that n is a, a subgroup of a smaller right angle arching group. So I have a finally generated normal subgroup that is full. Then the first thing that we prove is that this quotient is virtually abelian. So Remember that if I have that my right angle arcing group is a free group, I will have that the quotient is finite. So here I, n can be equal to zero, but right angle arcing groups uh, also fiber. So I can also have a, a quotient that is a free abelian group. So n is either a natural number or zero. So here, what we are saying is that this quotient is uh, abelian by finite. But the second thing that we proved is actually that the quotient is finite by abelian, which is a stronger than being abelian by finite. So the, this second thing implies the first one. So this is finite by abelian. So maybe a fancier way of saying that this quotient is finite by abelian is that N will be commensurable uh, to a kernel uh, of, a, of a character. So here, what I'm saying is that there exists a character in, in my first in my invariant such that n is of finite index in, in the kernel. So another way of saying is that basically the only way of having finally generated normal subgroups in right angle arcing groups is considering kernels of, of characters. So, uh, as as I have like at the beginning after uh, talking about uh, finally generating normal subgroups of free groups, I have stated that that theorem holds for for other classes of uh, of groups. So, for example, for free products or uh, finally presented groups with efficiency greater than one. 
And I also want to point out that even though we proved, or I have stated this theorem for right angle arcing groups, it also holds for other classes of groups. So this result also holds if my group is a right angle coxeter group. So if um, for right angle coxeter groups, so again, if I have a finally generated normal subgroup in a right angle coxeter group, it's co virtually abelian. And in a more general setting, it also holds for graph product with some restriction. So it also holds for graph product. And here I, I need to put like some restriction in the graph product, but maybe the stronger way of saying is that I don't have, I don't want to have a universal vertex. So with, without universal vertices. So uh, I, a vertex is universal if it's joined to all the other vertices in my in my graph. And if I want to have universal vertices, I need that the group associated to that vertex needs to be, for example, free abelian. So I I cannot have. So imagine that I have a graph product. And this is a universal vertex and I'm putting an F2. I cannot have this thing, but I can have a universal vertex and an abelian group. So this is allowed. Yeah, so uh, just a recap, basically, uh, final generate is normal subgroups in right angle arcing group have portion that is virtually, virtually abelian. So, after seeing the, the theorem, we go back to the motivation. So remember that the first motivation was understanding a finally generated normal subgroups of free groups. And for right angle arcing groups, we, we already understand them. So the question is finite by abelian. And the second motivation that I have given uh, is uh, the algorithmic problems. So finite presentation, remember that it's not enough to ensure that my, my subgroups of right angle arcing groups will have decidable algorithmic problem. And now what we want to see is that normality is enough. So let's talk about consequences. So I want to talk about the, the algorithmic consequences, but also uh, about some uh, residual properties, which is being conjugacy separable. So many people are familiar with being residually finite, but maybe being conjugacy separable is not uh, that known. And uh, Ashok Minashian has worked a lot in conjugacy separability of subgroups of right angle arcing groups. So I want to talk first about that. We say that uh, a group is conjugacy separable. So a group is conjugacy separable. So as you may imagine, it's conjugacy separable if I can separate to two elements that are non conjugate in G. So if for every two elements that I have in G that are non-conjugate, I have a, a finite group, the homomorphism, where the images are non-conjugate. So as you can see, if a group is conjugacy separable, it's in particular residually finite. So if G is conjugacy separable, then G is residually finite. But the other implication doesn't hold, and actually, Residual finiteness is something to passes to that passes to subgroups. So if I have a group and I have uh, that is residually finite, and I have a subgroup, that subgroup is also residually finite. But being conjugacy separable doesn't pass to subgroups, and it doesn't even pass to subgroups of finite index. So residual finiteness passes to subgroup. But being conjugacy separable doesn't even pass to finite in the subgroups. So may not pass to finite in the subgroups. So that's why we defined a, a group to be hereditarily conjugacy separable if that property of being conjugacy separable passes to finite in the subgroup. We say that uh, G is hereditarily conjugacy separable if all the finite index subgroups of G are conjugacy separable. So some examples of uh, hereditary conjugacy separable groups or more generally of conjugacy separable groups are virtually free groups. 
virtually polycyclic groups, uh, virtually surface groups. So as you can see, all these classes are conjugacy separable, and since they are closed by taking uh, finite in the subgroups, they are also hereditarily conjugacy separable. So all these classes are conjugacy separable, but also hereditarily conjugacy separable. So maybe you may wonder, like, okay, which is an example of a group that is conjugacy separable, but it is not hereditarily conjugacy separable. And uh, of course, subgroups of right angle Larkin groups are uh, very powerful source of uh, counterexamples, and they are also counterexamples for this. So first of all, the first result that I want to say is that right angle Larkin groups are hereditarily conjugacy separable. So this was showed by Ashon Minashian. I don't remember the... So he showed that rugs are hereditarily sorry, conjugacy separable. But uh, he showed also uh, with Armando Martino that subgroups of right angle Latin groups are not hereditarily conjugacy separable. So if we if we ask for finite presentation also finally presented subgroups of right angle Latin groups will also be bad from this point of view. So they are they may not be hereditary conjugacy separable. They showed that there are finally presented subgroups of rocks that are conjugacy separable, but not hereditarily conjugacy separable. So again, remember that when we are talking about algorithmic problems, even though right angle Latin groups have decidable algorithmic problems, we have seen that finite presentation is not enough for the subgroup to ensure that the algorithmic problems are decidable. And also thanks to this theorem, we can see that again, being picky with the finiteness condition. So asking for finite presentation is not enough uh, uh, for the subgroup to, to be hereditarily conjugacy separable. So maybe asking for finiteness conditions or thinking about finiteness properties is not a, a good approach uh, when dealing with algorithmic problems or uh, hereditarily conjugacy separable, separability, sorry. So we will see that again, normality is maybe the, the right property to, to ask for, for the subgroup to, be, to have also that it's hereditarily conjugacy separable. So as I have said, uh, Minashian has a very nice paper, the paper from 2012, uh, 2014, sorry, where uh, he uh, gives uh, sufficient conditions for a subgroup uh, to have decidable algorithmic problems and also uh, to be hereditarily conjugacy separable. And one of the, the main theorems that uh, he proves uh, is the following one. So I should so in in 2014, that if I have GX is a rack and I have a non trivial finally generated normal subgroup in the rack such that the, the quotient is virtually polycyclic, then he showed that under these conditions, so finite generation, normality, and having the quotient virtually polycyclic, then he showed that. N is hereditarily conjugacy separable. And he also showed that uh, N has a decidable conjugacy problem. So mixing this result that we have from Ashot Minashian and our result where we prove that the question is not just virtually polycyclic, but it's in particular virtually abelian, we will get that all the finally generated normal subgroups are hereditarily conjugacy separable and have decidable conjugacy problem. So the corollary of this theorem and our theorem is that finally generated normal subgroups of rats are hereditarily conjugacy separable, have decidable conjugacy problem. And since the question is a virtually abelian, they also have decidable membership problem. Finally presented subgroups of rats are bad from this point of view, but norm finally generated normal subgroups are, are good. So this is uh, the consequence that we have related to uh, this conjugacy separability property and algorithmic problems. But again, I also want to point out that this is a very specific uh, characteristic of right angle arting groups that doesn't pass to finally presented uh, subgroups of rocks. So the observation here 
is that uh, the the main uh, the main theorem. So having a question that is uh, virtually abelian is not true for finally present the subgroups of us. So, and um, for like in order to to have this observation, we just need to remember Rip's construction and then the work of Hagelon and, and White. So here we have the Rip's construction plus the work of and White. Where we have that, uh, if I start with a finally presented subgroup, so if Q is finally presented, then there is a shorter sequence of this form where this is finally generated. So my K is finally generated and it's normal in gamma. And this can be assumed to be virtually a finally presented subgroup. So if I have a virtually a finally presented subgroup of a rack, I have a finally generated normal subgroup where my quotient is Q and Q is any finally presented group that I pick. So it's not uh, a virtually abelian group. So it's a very particular um, yeah, property that we have for right angle arting groups that again uh, doesn't pass to finally presented subgroups. So it seems that finally presented subgroups of racks are very bad. How much time do I have? Bro? Okay, so I want to quickly uh, sketch the proof of, of the theorem because the, the proof is actually very easy and it's where um, the, the Basel tree appears. So, so let's do the sketch of the proof. So I have GS, which is my, my rack, and I have a non-trivial finally generated normal sub. And I want to show that the quotient is uh, virtually abelian. So first of all, what I do is take a splitting of a right angle arching group as an amalgamated split product. So for every vertex of, of my rack, so for every generator of my rack, I have a splitting of the, the right angle arching group in this way. So maybe I'm gonna, so for example, what I'm trying to say here is that imagine again that I have my favorite rack, the P4, and I take V to be my, my vertex V, the splitting that I'm considering here of the P4 is the following. So I forget about the V, so I have A, C, D over the, the link of V, so over A, C, and then the star of, of V, which is just, again, A, B, C. So these are the, the kind of splittings that I'm considering. So I have a splitting for each vertex of this form, and I have then an associated basal tree. So the first step, the second step is to notice that since N is a subgroup of the rack, it also acts uh, on the basal tree. And it can be shown that like the second step is showing that this action is actually minimal. And the third step is to realize that if I have a minimal action of a finally generated group, then from Basel theory, we know that the underlying graph of the quotient graph of groups needs to be finite. So this is finite. So if this graph is finite, the number of ages that I need to have in this, uh, in this quotient is finite. So the number of ages is finite. And if you have, if you count the number of ages that I have in this question, I will have all the possible orbits of the age. So I have GX acting in the Basel tree. Then I need to get rid of the, the stabilizer of the age, which is the link. And then I'm, I'm doing the question by M. So I have this thing. So I have that this double constant needs to be finite. But since N is normal, the, like this double coset and this single coset are in bijection, so I will have that this needs to be finite. So what I'm saying is that this subgroup is a finite index in my rack. So I will have gx and I have n times the link of p. So this subgroup is a finite index. But here I haven't been picky with the vertex that I'm considering. So I, I can do that for any vertex. So I will have that this falls for all the vertices. 
So, okay, I'm making a mess, I'm sorry. So the fourth step is to realize that if I take H to be the intersection of the links of all the vertices that I have, since this intersection is finite, I still have that this is a finite index in my right angular term. And the fifth step, and probably the last one, is to show that this quotient now lies in the center of G. And well, this is very easy because in order to show this, I need to take any element of GX and an element of H and see that uh, they commute modulo n. So basically what I want to show is that if I have a generator of my rack and an element of H, then they commute. So if I take the commutator, they commute modulo n. So that's what I want to show. But if I have that H lies in, in big H and H is this intersection, in particular, it also lies in N times the link of V0. So H is of the form N times something that link that lies in the link of V0. So now if I wanna compute this commutator, I never remember how uh, the conjugates are, but this is the commutator. So I can split by the commutator's identities in something of this form. So I have the single commutators and I need to put conjugates. And since X lies in, in the link, in particular, it commutes with V0. So this is a, a one, so they commute. And this, since N is normal and this lies in N, I have that this lies in my normal subgroup N. So I have actually shown that every element of GX uh, commutes with an element of H modulo N. So I have that this lies in the center. And maybe to finish, what I'm saying is that this lies in the center and this is of finite index. So we are saying that the center has finite index in my group. And if, if the center has finite index in the group, it means that the commutator subgroup is finite. So this implies that the commutator subgroup is actually a finite group. So I will have a sort of like sequence and we have said that this is finite. And this is of course abelian. So I will have that my quotient is finite by abelian and we get the result that the quotient is fully finite by abelian. So yeah, this was everything that I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? 